praise the Lord today, saints, hallelujah, to the Most High God, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your word today, and I thank you, God, that you have preserved me unto this hour. And Father, I just bless you so much for keeping me, Lord, ever in the palms of your hands, and squeezing me when you need to, Lord. And I just bless you, Father, and thank you so much for helping me through this trial I've been going through, Lord. Just, I just thank you so much and for delivering me, Lord, out of the mouth of the lion. Thank you, God. I bless you, Father. You are the holy God, the mighty Lamb. You're the great I Am, Lord Jesus. No, oh, Lord, we need you today. We need you to instruct us in your righteousness by your Spirit in the inner man. And we need you, Lord, to Keep us ever in the narrow way, Lord, and help us to walk with you and talk with you. To keep our focus and our attention upon you today. And each day, Lord, remind us, Holy Spirit, that we are not of this world. We are of your kingdom. We are of another kingdom than this world and the way they do things in this world. The way we used to do things before we met you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord Jesus, you reach the hearts of the people who will hear this message. That you reach into their hearts, Lord, and you give them strength and courage to commit to you their whole being. To commit to you every single ounce of their whole being, Lord, spirit, soul, and body. Because there's everything to gain, for you are everything, Lord Jesus. You are all that matters. And the only thing to lose is death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah to your holy name. Hallelujah. Because the ways of this world, Lord Jesus, are death and destruction. The touch of the earth and all the things of the earth, it's the earth touch, it's death. It has the curse pronounced upon it. You're going to do away with it. You're going to burn it up in a cleansing fire. And you're going to bring in your new heaven and your new earth, Lord Jesus. And I bless you and praise you for it and thank you for it. You are preparing a people for this hour as your battle axe, O God. Help us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to keep our focus upon you, to walk with you, to love you, to praise you and glorify you. Every minute of the day, even when we don't understand, Lord, we know you do. And that you will give us understanding as we seek your face. You will show us the things to come. You will help us through this day to love you and to praise you and to offer ourselves to you a living sacrifice, spirit, soul, and body. Everything we are and everything we have belongs to you, Lord. And I give you glory, honor, and praise, and I ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, saints. You know, we are in perilous times. We are. Very perilous times. We are in perilous times. And the Lord reminds us in His Word that He's never left us nor forsaken us. Okay? He's with us always, even into the end of the age. I had this dream back in the 1990s. And in the dream... I was in downtown Houston, that's where I grew up, and I was standing on Main Street in front of the Foley's department store, and all the cars were driving by, and it was just a beautiful, everything was clean, I mean, it was just like everything was shiny and clean, the cars were all, the colors were bright and shiny, the yellows, the greens, the blues, you know, the reds, it was just, everything was chrome and, and just shining, like you, you just have to just imagine this, okay, I mean, it was just like, like a showroom floor almost, and all the buildings were clean, all the glass was clean, the streets were clean, everything was clean, and there was this big gate on the side of the street, and President Kennedy walked up to the gate, with a, he was holding a black umbrella 
and he tied this black umbrella to the gate and when he did that everything in the dream just went to like a gray color it was, everything was gray it was just no more color it was like this evil wicked thing in the spirit just descended upon everything and the Lord showed me that it was at that time when they took prayer out of the schools and you know they removed everything about the Lord you know from the schools at that time in the late 50s early 60s and it was like it was like a nail in the coffin it, it had begun way before that but this nation being uh, settled by the pilgrims in the 1600s you know and other colonies were set up on the east coast by believers who came over here seeking refuge from persecution okay but then the nation wasn't founded until 1776 and it was founded by people who pretended to be Christian okay but for many years this nation was a nation who was it was growing and it was prospering and it was doing so many things but around the turn of the night the 20th century during from the Industrial Revolution 1850s and 60s right on up into where we are today this nation has been on a downhill slope a downhill slope spiritually and materialism crept in to the church materialism came in and it's been choking the life of Jesus out off so that the life of Christ cannot flow through the people of God like it should be flowing because materialism has become the God of the church okay materialism and things and fashion and everything that the world affords being brought into the church even the order of the world being brought in to the organizational church the people who say they love Jesus and they're Christians and they're following the Lord and they give more time to their self more time to their ways of following the Lord which are not the way of the cross than actually following the Lord they give the Lord lip service their heart is far from the Lord if you're a Christian today you are a Christian because of the faith of Abraham who believed God and God imputed it to him for righteousness okay you are a child of Abraham by faith you are of the seed of Abraham hallelujah and you are the seed of Abraham then as being the seed of Abraham like it says in Galatians that we are okay born of that seed the Lord Jesus Christ we should be walking like Abraham we should be walking like David walked. we should be walking the walk that the Saints of old walk Peter and James and John in the in the first century church but the church today is not walking that walk because they're just professors with their mouth because they have been consumed with materialism but the Father in heaven is so loving and so kind and so merciful that he is giving time and more time and more time and more time see God has already judged America by allowing this spirit to attack this nation because people have strayed from the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ you see that is the only way a person can be born again is by coming to the cross and dying and repenting of their sin and their pride and their arrogance against the living God and believing the gospel that the Lord Jesus has done the work for us and we must believe the gospel every single day we must take up our cross Jesus said daily and follow him that means deny ourself 
deny what we want, what we desire, what we think we have to have, and take up our cross. That's, that's taking up your cross, denying yourself. Your self-life, your soul man, your desires. Denying those. This is what the church should be doing daily. But it's not doing that. The church is seeking to get bigger and bigger and bigger and trying and making these organizations getting larger and larger. And it's pure wickedness. It is the vine of the earth mentioned in Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation 14 it talks about the vine of the earth. See, Jesus said in John 15, I am the true vine. Okay? And my Father is the husbandman. Hallelujah. Every branch in me that bears fruit, he said the Father, he prunes it, he purges it. That it will bring forth more fruit. See? But those, those branches that don't bear any fruit, they are cut off. Cut off. Is this church today bearing fruit? Do you see the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the meekness, the kindness, the faith, the temperance, the self-control? Do you see self-control in the body of Christ today? Or do you see a body of Christ indulging itself in the things of the world today? And the Lord is so merciful, He is going to cut the thorns, the thorn bush, that vine that has grown, the vine of materialism, God is going to cut that off at the root. Off of all those professors out there who profess the name of Jesus, but their lives are consumed with this world and the ways of the world. That's how merciful the Father is. And you're going to, in that day, you're going to say, Oh, God, why is this happening? See? I mean, many of you, you're going your whole life. You're my age. And you've spent your whole life from high school on working, 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 accruing, accruing, accruing. Just working and accruing and getting more stuff. Go out to your garage today and look at all your stuff in the garage. Just in the garage. Okay? think about go over there and pick stuff up off the shelf that you got back in 1980 back in 19 you know 85 1990 just sitting there on the shelf you ain't picked it up and since you put it there in 1992 okay. this is the life of America just more junk more junk okay where is Christ? Is Christ filling your heart more and more and expanding in you more and more? Is He becoming more prominent in your life every day? Is He becoming more just a desire that you have more of Him? That is your desire to have more of Christ expressed through your life? Or are you content where you are? The Lord wants us to be hungry for Him. Okay, once we get saved and filled with the Spirit of God, then it's a it's we have something to gain more of Christ. This is what Paul was crying in the book of Philippians, chapter three. He said, "Oh, that I might know Him." At the end of his life, he he's like, "I want to know Him. I want to know Him more." And today, people get they get born again and filled with the Spirit of God, and they go, oh, thank you, Jesus, for saving me, and they go and do what they want to do the rest of their life. They think just getting saved, that's it, and that's what the church is preaching. They're not preaching the cross. They're not preaching the power of God, see? People talk about wanting power, and today, this world's power is what they're talking about wanting. They mask it with the term Christianity. They mask it with the term work or whatever they mask it with but their power is money that's what they're talking about and the more power they have the more money they have they feel better they feel blessed of God 
But the Lord Jesus expressly said in the parable of the sower that the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke off the Word of God from bearing fruit. It chokes you so you can bear no fruit. And the Lord says He's going to cut the vine. He's going to cut the vine. And you have to know that. And the Lord says to you today, He challenges you that you would seek Him and say, Lord, how do I, how do I get this out of my heart, Lord Jesus? This desire for more stuff. How do I get it out of my heart? How do I get out of my heart this, this desire, this this bent, this this thing in me, Lord, that says I just have to keep all this that I have, just holding on to it, because somehow it's going to save me, it's going to preserve me, and it's not. Jesus said, "Our life does not consist in the abundance of the things which we possess. You can possess everything in this world and think you're blessed of God, and go straight to hell when you die." Or you can be the poorest person in this world. The poorest person with absolutely no money, no place to lay your head, one coat, one shirt, one pair of pants, and shoes that are falling off your feet, and know the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you die, you're going to go straight to heaven. Hallelujah. See? It's not about things. It's about the person, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The man. Hallelujah. The man risen from the dead. It's about him. And the devil is out to take that light, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to put it out. Or to, to direct it the way he wants to direct it. See, The devil is so content. I remember a story our, our friend in Oklahoma told us. She was sitting in the church. The little church she used to go to. Her and her friend were sitting there. And she saw this demon in the back right behind the, bapti the baptismal pool where they baptize people. She could see a demon just sitting there in the church. And her friend looked at her and said, Do you see that demon behind the baptismal? And she said, Yeah, I see it. I see it right there. There's a demon just sitting right there in the church. That shouldn't be. When Jesus went into the town, you know what happened when Jesus walked in? The demons came out of hiding. What are you, what are you doing here? Why are you here to torment us? See? There was power in his walk. Why? Because he was a crucified vessel. See? And when you walk as a crucified vessel, you're not tied to this earth. The things of this world are not tying you down where you have to have all these things of the world in order to feel like you're some important person in God's eyes. No, you don't need nothing of this world. The Lord is calling all of His children today to account. He's calling all you pastors out there, all you big name pastors out there, you millionaire pastors, millionaire pastors, you imagine that? Have millionaire pastors today in America. Millionaires. Hey, we've been in their homes, man, over in Oklahoma. You should see their homes. With huge rock swimming pools. I mean, and, and just elaborate furnishings like you just wouldn't believe. Living in 10,000 square foot homes. Or larger. And that was just one, okay? I mean, this is the filth and the garbage of the world, okay? Come into the church. And they think they're blessed of God when in all actuality, the, the, the deceitfulness of riches, okay? The things of this world, the deceitfulness of riches have grown up and choking the life of Christ off of them. See, the life of Christ is power. It is submission to the Father. That's taking up your cross. That's what Peter and John did on the day of Pentecost. I mean, they were surrendered vessels 
when Jesus ascended to heaven, he told him, you go tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. You shall be my witnesses. So they went to back to Jerusalem and they were just in the upper room meditating and talking and sharing and, and just praying and seeking the Lord. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they heard the mighty sound of a rushing mighty wind blowing. See, And the prophecy in Ezekiel 37 came to pass that day. And there were tongues of fire cloven and, and it rested on them. And they were filled with the Spirit of God. God Almighty came inside. The Lord Jesus Christ came in by the Holy Ghost. And they knew then exactly what, what was going on. They knew then. And Peter began to quote the prophecy of Joel. Oh, hallelujah. And the church was born that day. The church is a called out people, a living organism. It's not down the street at the building, okay? That's not the church. The building is not the church. The, the church is a people. There might be three or four people in that building who are the church. Okay? And there's probably ten out of a hundred. When you do the math according to the scripture, there's a tenth. Okay? But the fact remains, saints, is that this church of today that claims that they are of Christ are not of Christ. They are of the vine of the earth. They're of the world. They're religious. And God in his infinite mercy, because they have professed the name of Jesus, but you see, they haven't gone all the way. They haven't given fully surrender, full surrender to the Lord. And when they do, which they will, Many people will. When God cuts that vine and all this materialism is cut off and all this feel-good, happy-go-lucky life is, is gone, okay. many people are going to turn to Christ and go, Oh, I see now. I see now. Lord, forgive me. But the Lord says to you today, You can see now before it comes. So that you can get your house in order. So that you can begin to, to do as Christ has done. On the day of Pentecost when they were filled. And then Peter and John. Peter was preaching that sermon. And then the next chapter 3. He goes to the temple. Him and John. They're walking in. And there's that poor beggar. And that poor beggar. He's looking for a, a dime. He's looking for a nickel. Give me a penny. He needs something to eat. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But what, ha what I have, I'm giving it unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he grabbed him by the arm, and he just jerked him up, and he stood on his feet, and his ankles became strong, and he began to leap and praise God. Hallelujah! The church can't say that today for the most part out there. Because they got too much silver and gold. They, they depend on their silver and their gold. They're depending on their money. And as happened in the Bolshevik Revolution in the 1917 and 1918 in Russia. They went in and took all the surplus of the church. They took it all. They're coming to the church in America. They're going to do the same thing to the church in America. And where are you going to be then, pastor? Where are you going to be then, board of directors, in your church? Because there will be nothing left. They're going to close these banks down, I'm telling you. You Christians out there, you're hoarding your money, you got it in the bank. You're going to close the banks. You're not going to have nothing. Your card will not work anymore. What will you do? How you will moan and groan and cry. Because you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never fellowshiped with Him in suffering. You've never walked with Him. You've never denied yourself. When you see something, a new commercial comes on, and you see some fashion woman, 
You go out and just buy that fashion. You get this. You get that. You get that new makeup. Yeah, makeup is a multi-billion dollar industry. In the Bible, two women who, one, Esther. Esther was taken in. She was a virgin. She was taken in. She was Mordecai's niece. King at Xerxes, he had his wife, Vashti, she was pushed out because she wouldn't do what the king said. So he's looking for a new wife, and Esther was brought in, and she was very beautiful. And they, for about six months, they got her all refined and cleaned up and everything and anointed and brought her before the king, and she became the new queen, okay? So there was a, there was a time of purification for Esther. And the other woman mentioned in the Bible, it says... She painted her face in the actual scripture. It says she painted her face. And that woman was Jezebel. Okay? Jezebel. She painted her face. Now you think about that if you're a woman of God today. And you spend hundreds of dollars a month on makeup and fashion and, and, and thousands of dollars even per year on stuff to make yourself yourself your body look good for what so that people will worship you okay they will worship you that's what you want them to do you think you have to do that to be accepted you know who you have to be accepted by Jesus Christ humble yourself before the Lord that is the only person you need to be accepted by the Lord Jesus Christ and when he accepts you, it matters not what the world does. When he accepts you. Hallelujah. And you men, same thing with men. Oh, they have men's makeup out there now. I remember when I first came back to the Lord in, in 1994. It was late 94 and then early 95. And I was going to this church that had this big Friday night singles thing. And I went to there. And that pastor that ran that thing on Friday nights, that guy used to paint his face. And he had gold hanging all over him and all this. And this guy was so worldly. And he was so fake. And this is in the church today. And they call themselves after the name of Christ. They are not Jesus Christ. They are 180 degrees opposite. They are antichrist. They are against Christ. Because if a man or a woman is for Jesus Christ, they will preach the truth of Christ. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. That's what he said. But they're not preaching that out there. Because they are not of Christ. They're of this world. But after my wife and I were married, we went into the Christian bookstore. And that pastor comes walking in. He walked into the, to the Christian bookstore... And we were kind of going another direction, and he came in, in front of us, and he looked at me and Sharon, and he, his eyes just got real big, and his face was absolutely painted, okay? And he had gold hanging all over his neck, and he, and he, and he just looked at us like with this fear, and he just took off. I'm telling you right now, God is judging. But let me look at this. Look at this verse right here. Let's go here first. I got to take you over here to, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Okay. Peter is talking here. Let's just pick it up at verse 14. If ye be reproached, if ye be reproached, for the name of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Happy are ye. Oh, praise God. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of. But on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief. Or as an evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, 
Let him not be ashamed. Oh, hallelujah. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come, Peter said, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. See, people teach today, oh no, God doesn't want you to suffer. That is a lie. That's an antichrist spirit. Okay? That's an antichrist spirit saying that. Verse 19 again. Chapter 4. 1 Peter. The inspired scriptures. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Hallelujah. We can trust in the Father. We can trust in God that He keeps us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, preaching this message today, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, everything I've just spoken to you, let's look here. It's right here in the scripture. See, This is a prophecy Paul is giving to Timothy. And I'm telling you, in 1960, it even began before that, like I said. I mean, people were so haughty and high-minded. My wife's uncle, and he was a professor, he used to stand and sing in church. Do solos. They'd let him do a special on Sunday. He was saved when he was about 17. Worked at a bus station. Gloriously saved. Used to witness to people in the bus station. He'd witness to white people. He'd witness to black people. He'd witness to brown people. He didn't care their color. He thought, this person needs Jesus. He knew it. And he'd witness to him with the joy of the Lord. And that's all he was consumed with and concerned about. And one day the devil sent some pastor up there in a brand new 1954 Chevy. Shining. Oh, the chrome on that thing must have been something for him to see at 17. I guarantee you. And that pastor saw him doing what he was doing. He said, hey, you need to, you need to come to church. You need to, you need to, uh, no, he saw him witness to a black boy, saw him witness to a black fella. Oh, no, you, you need to come to church. You need to come sit in the pew where we can control you, okay? Not the Holy Spirit, but we can control you. Same thing happened to Sharon's brother, witnessing on the streets of Fort Worth to the lost, had a fruitful ministry. Praying for people, witnessing to people. That's what he did every day. He just that's what he did. He worked and then he'd go out on the streets and witness. And then some guy comes up, brother, you need to come to church and you have your gifts be, you know, controlled by us. And that's what this organization of man does. It takes the light of Jesus. And it says, okay, no, your light is too bright. We need to turn down that wick down here where you're just barely shining. Okay, now, we like that. We like that. Okay, now. And then they, they teach out there today, oh, you're a good Christian if you will sit under this eldership, if you will sit under this pastor, okay, this pastor who's not preaching the cross, this pastor who's not following the Lord according to the Scripture, but according to the bylaws of the Assemblies of God, or the Southern Baptist, or the Roman Catholic Church, or whatever denomination it is. As long as they follow the bylaws of that, and they sit under that, oh, you were a good Christian. But see, when Jesus looks at you one day, and he says, what did you do for me? You're going to say, oh, I was a good Assemblies of God Christian. 
Jesus is going to say, assemblies of what? You mean assemblies of people? They call it the assemblies of God? Is God really assembled there? There's people in the assemblies of God denomination who know the Lord. Okay? But the hierarchy and the whole structure of their whole organization, is it the cross? Is it the true walk like the first century Christians? No. No, it's not. Paul said right here. Before I finish saying what Paul said, Sharon's uncle, he, he never went back to witnessing like that. Never. From 17 on, he lived to be 80-something, and then he died. And he was had some religious demons with him. These, these things are very evil. I'm telling you right now. Many of you, you have these religious demons in your life. And they're masking their self as being something holy and of the Lord. Because you show up every Wednesday. You put your 5% and your 10% in the plate. And you're a good Christian. And they make you feel so good in your conscience that you're right with God. And the Lord's not going to judge you according to that how much you put in the plate. The Lord's going to judge you by how you treat His Son and do you believe the words of Jesus? Do you believe the word of Jesus? That Jesus said you must take up your cross daily and follow me and deny yourself? Why would Jesus say that? So that we are not controlling things, but so the Holy Spirit is controlling it. So that as he walked, he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. That's what he said. Okay, how much do I need to interpret that? What does Jesus mean by that? Let me give you an interpret. No. Just read it. Read the scripture. You don't have to be, it don't have to be explained to you by some man with letters after his name. Read the scripture for yourself. Open your King James Bible. Read a King James Bible. Don't read these other perverted English Bibles. Read a King James Version, authorized King James Version Bible. And don't give me your claptrap about the, the, uh, you know, the, the fact, uh, well, you know, these and vows and all this, you know, that is so, such an ignorant statement to make to somebody. The King James is the easiest text to read. The easiest. And to understand. So don't fall for that line of the devil. Okay. That you, the these and the thou's will trip you up. No, they won't. They'll make you read better. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then when you pick up a good book by Spurgeon or pick up a good book by Andrew Murray and you start reading that, you can read better because you spend time in the King James Bible. Hallelujah. In book right here of Second Timothy chapter three. In Second Timothy three, Paul's talking here, and everything I've been telling you see, it, it's it's come to pass. It, we're in the time right now, and the judgment's here, and the judgment's going to get worse and worse. You see, God's already judged this nation. Okay, the nation has that the church has said to God, listen. You know, all right, after in 1906 they had the Azusa Street Revival, and then shortly thereafter the Assemblies of God started. You know, they kind of they were a breakaway of A.B. Simpson, uh, the Alliance Church over in New York City. Okay, they they broke away from that. They had a church split, and the Assemblies of God formed, and and then the Azusa Street Revival. You had the Wales Revival. You had all these things in the early 1900s. You know, but then the materialism. I'm telling you, man, it came in and it choked off the life of Christ. People don't want the crucified life, okay? So what's God going to do? He's going to cut the materialism to teach the church in America and in the Western nations that the crucified life is the true wall. And those of you out there listening to me now, if you rebel against God in that time and you run to man and you bow down and you do what the government says, you do what man says in order to get a piece of bread, you are taking the mark of the beast. You are, you are worshiping man in order to get fed. Okay? Physical food. 
You're not trusting God. You can't say, oh, I trust you, God. Okay? When God says, don't lean on the arm of the flesh, says Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, cursed is the man that trusts the man and maketh his flesh his arm. Cursed. You say, well, that's Old Testament, John. Wait a minute. It also says, hey, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Is that Old Testament? It's in Hebrews, okay, chapter 8. See, that, that prophecy is being fulfilled today when people get born anew from heaven. Hallelujah. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come over oh, there. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Oh, we're there. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful unholy, wicked, without natural affection, no mercy, no no natural affection for people, there's, there's no, in the church today, you don't see this just automatic heart of giving, when, when they, when they see somebody in need, just, just give, just give, you don't see that in the western church, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fierce, despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Those that are good. Walk in the crucified life. Jesus said as the Father sent me, so send I you. The Father sent Christ to die. The Father sends us to die. Die to ourself. Take up our cross. Follow the Lord so that the Lord Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit can live his life through us in this earth and go forth conquering and to conquer. Hallelujah. Praise God. Without natural affection, these kind of people Paul's talking about are coming in the last days. And this we're we're in there. We're we're in those days. Have been for many years. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, traitors, backstabbers, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Oh, ha, ha. does that confirm what I've been telling you? Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. It doesn't say pleasure, it says pleasures. Oh, they got it. pleasures. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you see. These Christians, these PhD believers, you know, they have these ministries. And we're, we're having a trip to Israel. And you can, you're invited to come. And it's $3,000 a person. Okay. Plus, you have to bring money for the tips that you have to give to the bellboy, okay, at the hotel. They tell you you have to bring cash in order to be able to give tips to certain people. Oh, and they tell you, oh, you get to spend a little quality time with the leader. Mm hmm. Then as well, they, they say, we're going to have a cruise, an Alaskan cruise. So here's an, a whole group of professors in Jesus who profess they're born anew and filled with the Spirit of God. And, and they're going to go get on a cruise ship and, and, and dress like the world and act like the world and let all their skin be shown and, and just, you know, and acting just like the world, being like the world. And they're going to witness for Jesus on the cruise liner, I guess. The suffering servant, the one who had nowhere to lay his head. Is that true Christianity? No, it's Antichrist. It's opposite of, instead of Christ. It's a false Christ. They're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Oh, hallelujah. For of this sort are they which creep into 
houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses so do these also resist the truth many of you out there you resist this truth being preached to you today you've been resisting it God says stop it men of corrupt minds see people who resist the truth they're of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was see the folly of of Janes and Jambres and Dathan and Abraham and Korah and all those it was manifest to all the tribes of Israel they saw it manifest very shortly okay very shortly the ground opened up and swallowed them whole families and children and everybody all their goods went down in the fiery pit and Christians today if you want to keep holding on to all your stuff and trying to protect it and preserve your life Jesus said if you seek to save your life you will lose it that's what he said okay. now I know many of you have a big fat black sharpie and you like to go through your Bible and just black out those verses that Jesus said that you don't agree with you're your own private Jesus seminar and you sit in your living room and you just take your black marker and go right over the scripture and say I don't agree with that no, I don't agree with that when you open your Bible it don't take you long to read it does it huh maybe 30 maybe five minutes to read your whole Bible because <laughs> uh, you really don't believe it because if you believed it you'd live by it Oh, hallelujah. Verse 9 of chapter 3. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. 2 Timothy 3.10 But thou hast fully known my doctrine. That's what the apostle says. My manner of life, purpose, is purpose to exalt Christ. To walk with Christ to suffer for Christ Paul had it all in this world Paul was a very wealthy man he was a tent maker he had a I mean he made tents for the Roman army okay I mean he he had a very lucrative business Do you understand and he forsook it all for the name of Jesus and he got the crown of life hallelujah and the words and his life his experience is preserved right here in the scripture and when you walk with the Lord, you have many similar things that happen to Paul happen in your own life. Hallelujah. With different methods. Okay. But in the spirit, it's the same thing happening because you're being formed and transformed into the image of Christ. As Paul was. Hallelujah. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith. Oh, hallelujah. Long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me oh hallelujah yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution oh hallelujah but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures many of you when you were 15 you got saved you picked up the Bible and it was a King James Bible and you began to read it and you studied it for a year or two then you went off to college you started getting your mind poisoned by the professors and then your friends, you know, you wanted to hang around the cool guys. And so you you stopped reading your Bible so much. And you just kind of fell away. But you, you still went to church. And you're still in church today. But you're, you're not into the Word like you were when you were first saved. The Lord says, repent. Get back into the Word today. Why? Because it says, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scripture which are able to make thee wise unto salvation 
through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Today the Lord says to you, if you're listening to this right now, the Lord says to you to repent to repent. If you're following your own way, you're following the religious denominational way, okay? Repent. You know how far the Southern Baptists have fallen? They have fallen from grace. Fallen from grace. The Southern Baptist denomination. There are there are people we know who are Southern Baptists and they absolutely own liquor stores okay liquor stores and I remember in Oklahoma when we lived in Oklahoma there was a Pratt's grocery store okay and Pratt's grocery was owned by a Southern Baptist and they were at one time a very prominent grocery store there in Oklahoma and they did not sell beer in their stores or wine or liquor okay because it was against his religion. It was against what he knew the scripture to teach. About strong drink. He knew it was an abomination to God for people to be drunkards. But when he died. His children began to sell beer and wine in the stores. And then shortly thereafter they sold the store. I'm telling you right now, God is not happy with his people who profess his name, who say they love Jesus. They say they're Christians and they're just like the world or even worse because they are worse because they have the name of Jesus. But I'm telling you what the Lord showed us many years ago, saints. Many years ago. He's testing this world today. He's testing this world of Christianity in the Western nations. He uses people like my wife and I and other true believers to test these denominational religious people. And for the most part, what we found is the majority of them flunk the test every single time because of the programming of the devil upon their minds. They do not hold the scriptures in truth, in righteousness. Therefore, they've been turned over, okay, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. They think gain is godliness. The Bible says, turn away from such. Will you be one though one of those today who repents for walking in a false way and, and not walking the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ? The word of the cross is the power of God. The logos of the cross is the power of God. You want some power today? Then you take up your cross and you walk with Jesus. It's about the spiritual walk. It's not about the natural realm. It's about the spiritual realm. And when you see the natural realm shaking and broken and earthquakes and, and floods and famines and everything else happening in this earth and the sword of the Lord going from one corner to the other corner of this earth and cutting the vine of the earth when you see this begin to happen and happen right in front of your eyes, remember that the Lord is your salvation. You come to the Lord Jesus today. You repent today for following your own way. Your own made up way of the Lord Jesus. And you walk with Him in truth and in sincerity today. And you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Not what your pastor says the Holy Spirit is saying, but what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah.